today on Call Out, Nelson Search and Rescue enters bear country to help a badly injured tree faller. We flew over two really good sized bears, one grizzly and one that was maybe 200 meters away and it was definitely the biggest black bear I've ever seen in the Kootenays. And later, fully loaded command mobiles for search and rescue. It enables us to keep track of the search and plan the next operational period. Wednesday, 5.04 p.m. Nelson Search and Rescue was called out to Weimar, a small town nestled in the mountains of British Columbia's rugged Kootenai region. There's a, a gentleman doing some cat ski clearing of some bush who's fallen a tree on himself and has some deficits on one side of his body, possibly broken leg, pelvis, or back. Trevor Hallsworth was clearing a ski trail near the top of Baldy Peak with another father when he was struck by a tree. Stranded in the wilderness with no cell phone reception, Trevor's colleague had little choice but to hike down the mountain, a two-hour trek, and then drive towards Weimar where he could get a cell phone signal to alert search and rescue. It sounded like he was pretty high up. He was around 6,800 feet. You know, it's steep slope, lots of short alpine trees. It's not a very open terrain. I mean, there's not a lot of places just to land. Because they will likely have to long line the subject, a Hetz-equipped helicopter is now arriving at the SAR base in Weimar. The helicopter that Nelson's SAR members Dr. Mike Innes and team leader Chris Armstrong are now loading with medical gear will be used to locate and access the subject. They lift off towards Baldy Peak, one of the many mountains that make up the vast and uncharted Selkirk Range. Now, the search begins. Despite his colleagues' assurances that Trevor is located near the top of Baldy Mountain and will be easy to spot, this is not the case. We flew the entire ridge lines and did not find him anywhere, did not find chainsaws, colored gas cans, anything that gave us an indication where he might be. Subjects lost in the wilderness may look around their surroundings and think that they are easily seen, but many times this is not so. They should try to make themselves visible to search and rescue any way they can. This includes spelling out SOS with rocks, reflecting the sun off a shiny object, or waving a makeshift flag. Anything that has color, any way to make smoke, anything to get the attention of a rescuer, you, you need to do. After several minutes of circling around Baldy Mountain, the team decides to fly lower and search the area below the ridge. Soon after, they spot a man-made trail cutting through the alpine forest. We could actually see the path through the alpine trees, so we followed it, and it didn't take long to locate the subject. It definitely was difficult because of the clothing that he had. He was blending in pretty good. The only real reason we found him is that you could distinctly see that cat trail cut through the alpine forest. Trevor is extremely lucky that search and rescue found him when they did. Not far away, two large bears, no doubt looking for their next meal, are quickly closing in on his location. We flew over two really good sized bears, one grizzly right up on the alpine ridge above where our subject was and one that was maybe 200 meters away, and it was definitely the biggest black bear I've ever seen in the Kootenays. Bears in the wild are known to attack people when they perceive threat, but some will go as far as stalking and eating humans. In the last 20 years, bears have killed 53 people in North America, at least nine of whom were consumed. I mean, if a large bear came across a human laying in the alpine, not able to defend himself or move, they're opportunists, and that is an opportunity. With bears, cougars, and wolves calling these mountains home, the SAR teams don't take any chances. We have team members that do carry firearms, and the members that are carrying these firearms are licensed to do so. We've never had to fire a single shot, but we definitely have had bear encounters, and they will continue to happen. However, today, the team is unarmed and must be extra careful. They're banking on the helicopter generating enough noise to keep the bears at bay. The pilot finds a suitable landing zone, about a five minute hike from the subject, to drop off Chris and 
Dr. Mike. More of the ground SAR team arrive in the second helicopter. It will fly down the mountain and land on a logging road where it can be rigged for HETS extraction. Because there are no radio repeaters or cell towers in this remote region, the high terrain helicopter pilot will circle well above the accident scene and act as a communications middleman, relaying information between the ground team, the HETS pilot, and the SAR manager in Weimar. Yeah, there's five of us. Almost straight across, eh? Packing a portable stretcher and other medical equipment, the five-man team sets out in the general direction of the subject, keeping a keen eye out for the bears. Occasionally, they shout out to the subject and use his response to adjust their course. Help! Hear him? Almost 10 minutes into the hike, the team finally reaches Trevor, the injured subject. Uh, it was nice to see the guys after five, six hours up there by myself and know things were going to move along now that we had some, some real assistance and uh, I was, just wanted to get myself off the mountain now. High train 14. Go ahead for high train. We have a pelvic injury of some sort here. Um, get an assessment of the relay force. Yeah, roger. Feet, feet. Any chance of a femur or it's pelvis no, like, I don't have any point tenders. Fortunately, Trevor appears to be in stable condition, although completely immobilized by his injuries. We flew in there just to the right time. Just over there, there was a pretty large bear. They were quite concerned about where these bears were, and I'd been lying there, quiet there with my broken leg, and I guess there's a grizzly 100 meters away. This is not Trevor's first brush with bears in the wilderness. You know, I think normally if you're working with a chainsaw, the bears are away. But I was walking once, uh, coming down after cutting, and uh, got to the top of a rise, and I knew there was a huckleberry patch down below me, and I gave a shout, and my God, I, you know, all of a sudden you hear this, this thrashing in the bush, and this bear comes barreling up the hill, and it was a big grizzly, stood up at the bottom of this uh, opening, and he stood up on his hind legs, and my heart was beating like crazy. And thank God he turned around and ran down the hill. And uh, it took me about five minutes and I realized that my heart was still beating hard. To be on the safe side, team leader Chris Armstrong posts two members on bear watch at the edge of the clearing. At one point we did have a bit of crashing in the alpine just below us. We figured maybe the bear had came in a little closer to have a look. We didn't get to see him, but it definitely put everybody on edge because it was a really big bear. <laughs> This side, then I collapsed here. Trevor recounts the accident to Dr. Mike. He and another tree faller had been on Baldy Mountain doing some routine felling for his winter backcountry cat ski operation. Up there, we've been working on these cut trails for about 10 years. And every year, we try to go out and just do a little bit of cleanup and a little bit of work on the trails. In the winter, the trails turn into a pristine powder skiing paradise, accessible only by snowcats. We take people up adventure skiing, powder skiing, up in the mountains. We're in pretty remote areas, and we take them up in a snowcat, and then with a guide and a tail guide, we escort them down the mountain, skiing powder and all sorts of exciting drops, and it's pretty exciting stuff. Normally, tree fallers work at a safe distance from each other, but this time, Trevor wanted to direct his colleague. So this one corner, I wanted the trees dropped in a specific way, in a specific direction, and so I just stayed right there and looked away and then looked back and the tree was coming right down out on top of me. The butt of the tree ended up hitting me right across the hip on my left hip, but I knew something else was wrong with me. I felt pain in my right hip. And after about 15 minutes, it was pretty clear that I wasn't going to walk. I'm trying to keep a real stabbing tightness back there, but it's straight on the muscle. Trevor only clears trail in the summer, but it's definitely the most dangerous element of running his cat ski operation. 
Being a full-time tree faller is one of the most deadly jobs in the world. In British Columbia, up to 25 fallers a year have been killed. Trevor is hurt, but he can consider himself very lucky. He has a massive bruise on his left hip, but it's the right side that concerns Dr. Mike. We were initially thinking it might be a pelvic fracture, um, and so that requires a full spinal immobilization so that the injury doesn't get any worse. Mike is a huge asset to Nelson Search and Rescue. While all SAR groups have members qualified in first aid and CPR, very few have an actual doctor on the team. Hey Mike, I think I'll call Hetz. You concur? Yeah, I train 14. Go ahead for high train. Um, where we're at, there's really not any good ground to sit down. So can you relay to Duncan that we're gonna Hetz out of this location? Yes, Roger. When you've got Dr. Mike on board, I don't have to worry about doing the medical side of things. I don't have to worry about making a lot of those medical decisions. When he's there, I can make the scene safe, secure, organized. He takes care of the medical. He makes the medical calls. In addition, Dr. Mike can administer painkillers to injured subjects in the field, something most regular SAR members do not have the advanced medical training to do. You know, you're not shocking right now. I don't think you need to start an IV. When it comes to giving uh, uh, painkillers or analgesics in the field, um, that's one thing that I can offer uh, subjects. Uh, uh, that being said, it's always a difficult decision. Uh, you have, always have to weigh the benefits versus the risks. You certainly don't want to have unwanted side effects that you can't deal with. But certainly uh, relieving pain often aids in the evacuation. What we'll do, let's get a spot here cleared out, guys. I think probably we'll... Dr. Mike is a blessing to us. He's not just a doctor, he's a doctor with wilderness-based skills. He's gonna make different decisions than a medical doctor from a hospital would. Just because you know how to provide uh, medical care doesn't mean you can provide it efficiently or safely uh, in the outdoor environment, especially in some of the challenging terrain and, and weather that we deal with. You know, when you're out in the snow dealing with uh, a hypothermic patient or, you know, first of all, your, your IVs freeze and uh, to try and start an IV is a difficult procedure in itself, but to try and do it in, in wind and rain and uh, when you're shaking and cold and, uh, you know, it's a very different uh, approach. There's been times in the past where, you know, there's decisions that have to be made. Should we stop CPR? You know, should we fly directly to the hospital? You know, our only ability is to use our comms to talk to the paramedic down in the valley or call an emergency room and talk to a physician directly. Having the doctor on board, all that stuff is out and is gone. He makes those calls. Based on his medical evaluation of the subject's injuries, Dr. Mike decides that Trevor should be flown directly to a regional hospital in Trail not back to SAR base in Weimar, where he would require further transport in an ambulance. So the subject's now packaged, he's pretty stable. Uh, definitely a hip injury. Uh, we're just waiting for the HETS team to fly in the ARP and somehow flight harness for Doc here and uh, we'll get him out of here pretty quick. Dr. Mike will accompany the subject on the end of the HETS line. He retrieves the ARP, or aerial rescue platform, and the team works quickly to package Trevor for evacuation. Dr. Mike was not always this proficient in the backcountry. His first foray into search and rescue was by chance, when during a casual hike in the woods, he was flagged down by a woman covered in blood and requesting urgent medical attention. Dr. Mike soon found himself on board a helicopter, racing to the scene of an accident on a steep mountainside where a seriously injured climber was in need of evacuation. We were able to call in the climbing rangers from Banff uh, who flew in with their long line and uh, placed them in a sling and uh, they long lined them off the mountain, which was extremely slick. I was totally out of my element there. I was in good hands with the guides, but uh, um, that's when I sort of vowed to become more proficient at this. And if I was gonna live and play in uh, in the Kootenays then uh, and thought I should uh, become a little more proficient at that uh, side of things and so that was the start of my search and rescue career. That was 10 years ago and today Dr. Mike is a seasoned SAR volunteer. 
He hooks up to the long line and they are gently lifted off the ground. They will be flown down the mountain to the HET staging area where Trevor can be loaded inside the helicopter for transport to hospital. So subjects flown out, we're just gonna head back to the original LZ. It's a nice spot to pick us up with that little 206. So it's quite a horrendously large black bear over here. So we're just gonna... They took me to the doctor and uh, he did some orthopedic surgeon uh, work in there and uh, put three screws into my, uh, my femur and I was out of the hospital four or five days after that. Trevor is now safely back home to his young family. He'll be on light duty this cat ski season, leaving the guiding activities to his capable team while he recovers. Let's go to the restaurant. His injuries yeah. could have been much more grisly had search and rescue not arrived on scene. There was two bears in the area and he'd been out there for six or seven hours. I mean, there's a great possibility that a bear could have found him and that would have been it. Now, fully loaded command mobiles for search and rescue. It enables us to keep track of the search and plan the next operational period. Canadian search and rescue teams are equipped with an impressive array of high-tech equipment designed to support even the most challenging missions. The mobile command post in particular is a powerful resource that enables search and rescue teams to function from virtually any location. A great deal of thought is put into their design. There's a severe space limitation so consequently, whatever happens inside those spaces has to be very carefully designed. And that design should follow form, follows function philosophy. And in this case, it's the incident command system. The incident command system defines the process of search and rescue. It's almost like a production line where we start at one end of the truck with all the planning, goes through all the way to operations where the assignments are done and issued to the teams and briefed and off they go to complete their assignments. When the teams head off, they'll be carrying GPS radios with them. The six portable radios that we carry in, the, in this truck are equipped with the GPS microphones. That allows us to track each team that carries one of those radios. The GPS radios are tracked on the status map sure. workstation. This is particularly helpful in noting the areas covered during a search. The status map workstation is where most of the action in a mobile command center happens. It's where the mapping and all the initial information is laid out. It can be used electronically with the overhead projector or it can simply be used as a big whiteboard with a paper map and a plastic overlay. And then in that case it's back to the old fashioned style using the colored pens. Sliding map boards provide additional backup. If the electronics fail, we always have the ability to manually pull out maps and start to lay overlays on them and plot our search areas from this. What we've got in here is a quite an extensive computer system which may look excessive, but on a large incident, we're looking at managing possibly 100, 150 people it enables us to keep track of the search and plan the next operational period. Although we use a lot of computers, we still need to have our fail-safe systems. So regardless of what we're doing electronically, we still use a lot of the old-fashioned techniques, which is to do our assignment sheets and also have the old magnetic name board where we can assign names onto different tasks manually. A recent addition to our toolbox has been two thermal imaging cameras to search in darkness. This is a temperature differential, not low light. These cameras can see in any kind of light, even in daylight, and it will show the temperature difference between whatever it's looking at. Downstream two, far side. Another recent addition has been this computerized radio console. It's actually a dispatch console that allows us to connect radios, cell phones, satellite phones together and allows people in the field to actually speak over a satellite phone if required. This way we can connect to other agencies, to ambulance, to police, to fire. 
we can link somebody who calls in on a cell phone directly with a volunteer in the field on a VHF portable radio so they can have a two-way conversation. This is a BGAN satellite unit that uses InMarsat. This is a low orbit satellite that is very much reachable from our part of the world. This allows us to not only use a phone line but gives us broadband access to the internet. Quite often we're operating in boundaries that are way beyond normal cell coverage. And although the satellite data is incredibly expensive, at least now we have the ability to go on Google Earth or other resources to assist in our mapping and search plans. High tech, low tech, all in one box, on wheels. It even comes with coffee. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.